Square One DSM is an initiative of the Greater Des Moines Partnership. Since 2007, Square One DSM has been connecting entrepreneurial needs with qualified resources as well as providing guided professional and business direction. Square One DSM helps entrepreneurs maximize their successes by helping them navigate resources, strengthen knowledge, improve skills, form strategic alliances, and secure proper capitalization. To find out more about Square One DSM, visit squareonedsm.com. Uh, the bad news is it's a packed house and it's warm. The good news is we actually have amplification now, so you'll actually be able to hear us. Did everybody in the back here okay? Yes, I got a thumbs up. All right. This is an all-time record. We've never gotten this many people together before for startup stories. I guess the answer is just talk about money, and everybody will come running. Um, usually, when somebody says free money, everybody runs. There's no free money. I'm not giving any out. Um, I'm Mike Caldwell. I work for the Greater Domain Partnership, which is a regional uh, chamber of commerce, economic development, community development group. You are in their brand new headquarters. We were in uh, temporary headquarters for 21 months because the Oscars fire basically destroyed this building. So it was gutted and remodeled. If you're interested, next Friday from 3 to 6, there's an open house to show the place off. We do ask you RSVP. If you signed up today and gave us your email, you're going to get a link after the meeting on how to RSVP. If you didn't sign up via email today, this Friday? It's this Friday. It's two days away. <laughs> Kim, raise your hand. This is Kim Bankhauser. Everybody say thank you. She got you on the stuff. If you would like to RSVP for the event, please see Kim afterwards if we don't have your email. If we have your email, you'll get an email today on how to RSVP. We just ask you to do it. I don't think there's any charge or anything. It's just getting an idea of crowd, as you can see. Crowd control. Crowd control. So we're also testing out the new HVAC system, which I, you know, is not bad, but it was like cold in here about 30 minutes ago. So that's uh, what happened to put 100 people burning. Gene, oh. come in. I picked Gene Meyer, president of the partnership. Thank you. I'll let you pick up Gene. All right, so before we get started today, next month's event is a company called Drive Spotter. And Drive Spotter actually about a year ago was in their second week of the Global Insurance Accelerator. And since then, they have an, had an amazing run. They have uh, some new announcements. I can't give up their announcements because they're still uh, uh, embargoed. But there's going to be some really big time announcements. I mean, like big time announcements going on next month when they're here. Uh, they are expanding rapidly. They are doing great business. Uh, it's really wonderful to see somebody just a year on doing that much. Uh, so that'll be our event next month. It is on the 16th of March from 1130 to 1, same format. Um, and if everybody comes, we can break the record, so we'll, we'll see how we do with that. <laughs> so here's what we want to talk about today. There's a real mixed message in the market when it comes to private capital for businesses. Um, the HALO report, which is one of the bigger national reports that angel investing came out, and the numbers were through the roof. Valuations were up, the amount of money was up, everything was up. And then within a week, everything's down. Other things are coming out saying investments down, valuations are down. Uh, the one that got my attention, uh, if you're familiar with Union Square Ventures, Fred Wilson, uh, runs that DC firm out of New York. He, every year he writes his 10 predictions, and what's nice about it is every year he goes back and says how he did. And he bats better than 500 on his predictions. And his predictions were that everybody's going to mark down the portfolios this year. That almost every startup out there that's not actually making real net income is going to see their valuations drop. And we've already seen it was a big square raised around, there's a down round, there's been a lot of down rounds. And so, at the same time, here locally, we've seen a couple companies be very successful. So, Pummelwise just raised $7 million locally. Uh, Agrisync announced the other day publicly a raise of about 450k at a seed level, pre, really pre-product level. These guys know of quite a few that are going on right now that are very strong raises that are happening. So, what we really want to talk about today, and why I put all these gentlemen together, is to talk about this mixed message. What's the story of private capital for startups and early stage growth companies? Everything from that seed investment all the way through large scale Series A, Series Bs. So with me today, to my right, first of all, is James Nazer. He's with LWBJ Capital Advisors. 
take the company public, done a lot of fundraising as an investment banker at this point, uh, doing a lot of uh, M&A, capitalization, variety of things. I work with them on many deals. At the other end, Matt Busick, who's the principal of Riverbud Private Capital. Matt has been working with private investors for many years, uh, doing placements into not only traditional investments, but alternative investments, like uh, growth companies uh, and later stage startup companies. To his right in the blue vest, Sheldon O'Ringer. Uh, last served as CEO of Calaris, uh, which we recently transacted. Uh, he's got quite a set of credentials. A lot of us didn't realize what he got here, just how much background he had. He's taken a company public, he's raised large amounts of money. He's been a very active angel for many years, uh, active not only here, but in CTEC Angels in Colorado. Uh, so Sheldon brings a tremendous amount of knowledge to the table. And last, but certainly not least, Eric Lohmeyer. Um, Eric is uh, works in larger scale capital, I would say, five to twenty million dollars. Is that right, Eric? Am I, am I hitting the right numbers? Sometimes uh, even, more. even more merger acquisition. Uh, again, so we, we kind of go with the scope here. Uh, myself, I'm an angel investor at the, at the bottom end of the scale, uh, very much a newbie, early stage. Sheldon, angel, and then on up through the sequence. So to kick this off, I want to start out with JD. Uh, JD. What do you see in common across these deals that are succeeding? Because we see a lot of people that say, I can't raise capital, I haven't been successful, <coughs> yet we're seeing deals that maybe on first blush, I wasn't sure it would be able to raise and actually have filled out the rounds. What do you see in common with the companies that are filling around on that early stage, the seed angel stage? What do you see in common about them? That's a good question. Hear me okay? Yeah. Um, you know, I think initially it's a dis disruptive idea or, or servicing product. Um, it is a lot to do with the founder or the entrepreneur. They're tireless, they're passionate, they're curious, um, they're good listeners. Um, they understand the market that they're moving into, they understand the customer, they understand who's going to make the buying decisions. Um, they've done a lot of, if you will, legwork. Um, again, good listening, good listener. They've gone out and, and haven't just necessarily built something in a vacuum and hope the marketplace will acquire it. Um, it's a scalable business model generally um, that's well thought out metrics that they, they know the metrics that drive their business um, again they also know what it's going to cost to serve the customer um, so and they with our assistance or others you know it's the ability to, to, to formulate a, a, a nice financial forecast that is is you know sound in metrics to drive it um, the, the other piece is too that I, I think is common is that a lot of times they're, we're, the, we're attracting them to smart money, not just financial money, but either it could be an angel that can bring additional qualities to them, it could be strategic investors. Um, at the end of the day too though, the capital is for execution, not for discovery, and, and a lot of times early stage businesses want to go raise a, a substantial amount of money, but really haven't discovered the market or completed the product or even know how they're going to sell it. So it, it, it really is down to that entrepreneur and that, that tireless passion to, to move the ball. Thanks. Let's go down to Matt at the other end. Um, Sheldon, if you want to hand Matt the mic. Um, no, sorry, we don't have enough points. Um, <laughs> Matt, there's a lot of I mean, a lot of angel investing in early stage money is private individuals. And that makes up a lot of that earliest money. You've been working with private individuals that are investing in alternative for some years. What do you see as the state right now? Where are people's heads at? And especially as it relates to the fact that the stock market is not doing what it was doing. And there's not a lot of positive about, you know, when people are predicting the market for 16 and the public markets, it's kind of a, we'll be lucky if we keep it flat kind of message. So what are you seeing with the private investors? Great, thanks. Uh, well, one of, the, one of the things probably that would help me answer this question is put in context what we do uh, so you can, so it's easier for me to answer the question. Um, I think of our organization as helping people who are otherwise inclined to do angel investing do it uh, with better, uh, better discipline. Uh, so what we do is pool people who have a, a desire to put capital at risk in private business together so that we rep collectively represent a bigger dollar amount going into companies um, and are able to then you know, get a better sense for the things that JD was just talking about. Uh, and ultimately uh, strike what we hope is a, a, uh, a good partnership with the inventor or the entrepreneur. Um, so having said that, I think, as I was contemplating, we did give us a chance to think about these questions before we hit the panel. Um, I think 
the answer is people don't necessarily wake up and say they want to put money at risk in a private business. Um, so make, most of the time what happens is a, a uh, motivated, uh, inspirational person reaches out, finds you, and says, you're part of my family friends network, um, I've got this great idea, would you invest in me? Uh, that's one way in which it happens, and so you get pulled into the deal flow. Um, and I would I would argue that's the worst way to <laughs> the deal flow. Um, or uh, you are a known uh, easy target. You have money because remember the Securities and Exchange Commission requires uh, that you meet the accredited investor standard in order to be part of an exempt offering. So. The SEC is, is moving that number around a little bit right now, but traditionally it's been uh, an individual with more than 200000 in income, or individually, or a household with more than $300,000 a year in income, or more than uh, a million in what's known as marketable security portfolio. So I think everybody here probably understands that, but just to set the stage for what is accredited, if you're known in your community as being above those bars, then you're somebody that uh, will be touched by folks looking for money. So I think you get pulled into deal flow that way. Um, or there are crazy people like me who encourage it. <laughs> um, I think that the, the, if you do it right, the, there is a spot in everybody's individual portfolio for private investing. Uh, and what I mean by do it right, you start first with an asset allocation design uh, individually or corporately um, that surely has one part allocated to equity and one small part of that, smaller part of that equity allocation uh, should be seriously thinking about private equity. Uh, and of course, there are lots of different forms of private equity. Uh, today, uh, we're talking about venture capital and, and there are even you know, different stages of venture capital. And I think that should be part of everybody's portfolio because if you do it right, and what I mean by do it right, right size, the right number of positions, you need, if you do one, you better be doing 10, in my view. Um, you can, in the entirety, generate better returns, I think, as an investor. Uh, but it's really complicated and it's really hard. So, I don't know, did that answer your question? I think so. I think so. I do think there's a, an often time belief that this is a simple process. And I think anybody that's, been, that's in the room that's raised around, and the gentlemen up here that have done this before, uh, and some of the ladies and gentlemen in the audience, audience <coughs> building, it's very complex. And it just can't be overstated how complex it can be and expectations. And it's like anything else. You get a lot of chances to do it right, you don't get very many chances to do it wrong. Uh, let's switch over to Eric. Eric, we've seen, I mentioned the deal here with uh, FunnelWise raising $7 million. Um, What's it like right now raising larger rounds? That should be on for you. Okay. Is it? Okay. There we go. Um, I, yeah, I'll qualify this real quickly. So the primary role that I play in our firm plays is in the mergers and acquisitions environment. Um, and, and to uh, Mike's point earlier, we I, we tend to play, like last year we were anywhere from on the low end 10 million to 160 million in specific deal size. So. I would say it's a little more of an institutional framework, and we're a little more on the venture capital panel, but I absolutely think that there are macro trends that are quite relatable to both sides. And so, you know, when it comes right now to the, what all, again, I'm gonna kind of say it in an institutional capital framework, I think what we're seeing today, and so this is, this is very market relevant, through probably the first half of 2015, and for at least the two and a half or three years prior to that, it was almost to the extent of Matt's, Matt's perspective on it's a friends and family race in the institutional capital markets. Um, so if you were of a certain size and you know, your company had been around long enough and you hire a decent investment bank to work with you, you know, whether that was on the, primarily on the, on the debt side but also on the equity side, it was not a very difficult thing to raise money. And as, it, as the you know, cycle really turned, I think it became um, a very much a seller's market. So if you were actually pricing a debt offering or maybe even an equity offering in the middle of 2015, it was probably the best time to price that type of offering. So you were getting the best terms as an issuer, selling your security to a private market um, than you possibly have ever gotten, and, and it certainly is in the 20 years that I've been in business. 
I will also tell you, though, that I think a lot has changed in the last six months. I don't want to equate it to a change like we saw in the end of 2008 with kind of the seminal event of the Lehman Brothers failing, but I will say that it's, it's not 180 degrees, but probably 150 degrees to where the buyer, the investor pool, is much more discerning right now. So, you know, from a public company perspective, you're not an Apple today. If you're not, I mean, you go out and raise $10 billion on any terms you want. You know, if you're an Apple, they did it yesterday in a debt offering for 3.x percent for the 10-year paper. Um, you know, that's not too far from where the U.S. Treasury, but if you don't have one of those brands, one of those names, and frankly, more cash on your balance sheet than you're borrowing, it is a much more discerning environment today. So I would really not, uh, we, sometimes I think our firm just kind of got lucky, you know, by timing, you know, we were in the right time and the right deal at the, at the right place. The market environment today, as I, I'd say, has changed, is changing pretty markedly for raising funds. Um, again, and that's on the institutional side, but I, to your point earlier, I think that absolutely correlates um, on the venture capital side. If I'm looking at venture capital, we certainly have some perspective on those. We see some of those deals. Um, I think a lot of the money on the sidelines, so the money that's still in the funds and hasn't been expended, I think you'll see a really good part of that money picking and choosing between their existing portfolio companies on who to basically invest in the next down round, as opposed to going out and searching for the next Twitter. Um, so it, it is going, it is, I think, where today we're in the earlier stages of the market realization of that. The benefit to Iowa, and then I'm going to talk long enough, the benefit to Iowa is I think, they always talk about we don't have as much volatility, that's true to an extent, but the other benefit in this market, we don't necessarily get the extremes on the coasts, you know, I say the coast, but we'll call it whether it's Silicon Valley or, or something on Boston. We don't really get the extremes on the on the valuation, if you will, on the upside, but I also think there's a time lag, actually. So our investor pool, I don't want to say uninformed, but it, but it seems that we're six or 12 months a lot of times behind on you know the changes in the market on the coast. So we don't really read about those changes until probably six months after they've started when somebody read about it in the Wall Street Journal. So I, that's kind of what I'm talking about. I think we're a little behind the curve there as far as the reality of you know, where, where the investor sentiment is going. So I think you, there is actually a window for Iowa or Midwest deals where, you know, there's still some, some possibilities, but I don't think it's going to get any easier. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Sheldon, let's go back to the other end of things. Uh, you and I have worked on several deals together in the recent past, and one of the things I've no noticed is your often the advice you provide to people um, is rather than reading, you know, taking one big round of capital, right? Somebody says, I need to raise $3 million for the next three years' run. And you often will say, well, why don't you look at raising just what you need to get through a shorter amount of time? And I know that's a consistent message for you. You've got a deep background in angel investing. Can you give us kind of the, the, the why behind that? Why, when there are these companies with their first round, why, are you, why do you get that kind of advice? Yeah, I'll try to do that. Let, let me first ask a question. I was just wondering, um, in this audience, how many people either have a business that they're looking at raising money, currently raising money, raising money in the last three months. How many people are kind of this entrepreneurial raising money realm that's here right now? Quite a bit. So probably more, maybe maybe not for you, but more than I would have, I would have thought. That's obviously pretty good for, for Des Moines. Um, well, I will say you've got the entire global insurance accelerator. Okay. Okay. Current, <laughs> with the current class of the DIA raising hands. <laughs> Okay, they're, they're being shy, there's more than that back there. Uh, so there are a few people that are not from Des Moines. Um, so, I mean, you know, 101, right? I mean, you got an idea, maybe you, maybe it's software related, you got something, you know, accomplished in your software, so you're raising money, because you can only go so far, the valuation is gonna be X. I'm not here to price it, the guys next to me price the deals. I mean, I'm either on one side raising it, on the other side investing in it. But, uh, um, you know, it's worth less when it's really young, right? So if you're the entrepreneur behind it or it's a group of people behind it, you only want to give up so much equity, right? So if you need to really raise $500,000, but you really only need $100,000, uh, these are just rough numbers, for six months and you need more money down the road, you might think, well, I want to raise it all up front. If you raise it all up front, and it just happens to be a million dollar valuation, you maybe have given up then post money, then post money, 33% of your business, right? A million pre, a million and a half post, you raised a half a million. 
as compared to you raise hundred thousand, whatever you need to just get you six months. So maybe you have been a proof of concept. Maybe you have your first customer. Maybe now you're able to say, "Wow, the valuation of my company now is whatever one and a half million uh, pre money rather than post." Now I'm going to raise the next hundred or two hundred thousand. Kind of understand what I'm saying there? Any nods? Anybody not understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That that's really the realm of I think the question that uh, Mike's asking me: Why take less early? Because you're giving up less of your equity, right? And you know there are. Uh, here in the state of Iowa, there's, there's places that Mike and Square One, you know, can help take you to, to get some, you know, through a venture net to get some other uh, demo type of money, if you qualify further with some more equity to get even some loans, again, so that they're not diluting your equity. So, you know, it, it isn't all, I mean, most people think it's my money first, then it's friends and family, and I'm going right to Series A. Series A, you know, typically that's for something that you've got some traction on. You've got something going, uh, in theory, revenue, but you've got a, you know, you've got a bigger, sustainable, you know, type of business opportunity that requires outside money, outside of, you know, kind of friends and family. Um, and you probably have proven something at that point along the way, whether it's revenue, customers, uh, patents, you know, whatever it is. So hopefully that's most of what you're looking for. All right. Well, just just to, to you all, we're going to start taking questions from the audience in just a couple of minutes. Uh, before we do that, I would like to real quick ask each one of you to talk about what you're looking for specifically going forward, what kinds of deals you're looking for. What do you think the segments are? You, do you look by segment? Are you thinking about certain segments? And the reason I'm asking this is you, somebody mentioned the, the, the next Twitter kind of thing. I think for a while this market's been in the let's go find another unicorn mode. And the unicorns are all dying. Um, there's definitely a disease among the unicorns right now. They're going down fast. But what are each one of you looking at as you do? They are. Um, just watch. It's going to be really sad to watch it. But what are you guys looking for? Jamie, start with you. What kinds of deals do you think are really investable that are coming forward? Well, I mean, first of all, we'll, we'll help early, very early stage right. companies get ready too, right? right. Get, and we, we use the term get them on offense versus defense, even help them flush everything right. out. Right. And to Sheldon's point, help them maybe think about even going to friends and families once we've assisted even in that process to go get market traction. Um, you know, from our investment banking side, obviously, is the Series A right on, you know, of a, at least a million dollar raise. But again, we'll take them all the way through the early stage and then obviously the carry on rounds as well all the way through maturation and exit. I mean, we, 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 we really are strong believers in the life cycle of the company and being involved all, all through facets. But, um, you know, a lot of times I'll refer clients back to you, right? and you'll refer them back to me when they're ready and stuff like that as well. So it, it is, I mean, we'll have a meeting with anybody, and we'll give our time to anybody with regard to trying to help them, you know, kind of sort through some stuff. The important thing is as long as they're able to manage their expectations too. And, and I think Sheldon made a couple of really, really good points as well on valuation because a lot of times, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder and they think that their baby is worth a heck of a lot of money. And and so initially in our meetings, we can really kind of vet who 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 has it, right? Who gets it, um, and, and who who kind of understands that path forward. But um, we're we're probably a little bit unique in that we kind of we'll work with all life cycles. Okay. Um, there's there's a couple things that that we look for, and this would be much I'd say on the latter 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 stage of venture capital, maybe more like early stage or young stage of private equity. But what we're looking for today, and I think there's a really nice opportunity for the next ten years or so. It's not on the demographic wave of exits. I mean that's what we do as you know professional. When I'm looking where where I'm looking to invest is in kind of that pre-demographic, they're not there's a there's an entrepreneur, someone who started a company perhaps, or maybe they're a second generation owner. Um, and they've got a, they've got an existing business, it's a successful business, there's some infrastructure, there's a management team. And maybe that business is a $10 million revenue company today. And that person certainly sees the opportunity or the market opportunity or region opportunity to take that to 20 or 30, but doesn't necessarily have the horsepower or necessarily the capital to do that. And what we're more, most interested in, this is again as, as what I'll call merchant banking, but actually investing in, is that type of company where we'll actually take a main minority interest in that company, and maybe it's to help that person take some money off the table, all their net worth tied up in that company and has been for 10 years. Um, maybe it's a situation where it's, it's, let's put some capital in this business to help that company kind of achieve its growth, but we'll take that minority position in that company. So that's where it kind of is a little venture capital-y. Absolutely. 
Um, so it's not a control investment by any stretch, but we'll, we'll bring governance. We'll put a board of directors together. We'll rewrite the operating agreement of that company. And it's all building kind of, what I'll say is kind of redeveloping the infrastructure of that company, which we think sets that company up to achieve, not just achieve, but to successfully integrate and, and grow and, and to uh, you know, get to that growth scenario without really kind of betting the farm you know, every time like they had to on the first round. So that's one side. The other side, and this is, this is a little more where I think some of the market's going, and it's actually more specific to, let's call it, you know, we're in Iowa, the Midwest, agricultural markets. I think there's a, there's a real opportunity, I know there's a real opportunity today in distressed companies. So that might be a manufacturer or distribution company. Um, there was a, probably the hottest agricultural market in the last 30 years that kind of ended in, uh, in 2012, 2013, and we're in, we're in a pretty steep down cycle right now. So you have a lot of businesses that were scaled up, um, you know, for a, a 20, you know, their annual revenues grew from five to 20 in five years. They scaled up to be a $30 million business thinking times we're gonna go forward. Well, now they have a cost structure that's 20 million and a revenue that's 10. Well, these are good companies, a lot of good products. They can, they can do really good things, but they have a really messed up capital structure and, and, and not just capital structure, but also an operating cost infrastructure. So where we see some real opportunity in the next 12, really the next 6, 12, 18 months, is to, to identify and look for those types of opportunities where we can again come in, perhaps provide some capital into that business, help them right size, maybe be the kind of the good cop, bad cop scenario, maybe it sometimes be the bad cop to help them kind of operationally right size for that $10 million business. Um, I think there's some great opportunities there as well. Eric, I want to meet with you afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm looking for one of those distressed companies to, uh, to invest in. Um, what was the question? <laughs> what do you look for? What do you look for right now? What are you specifically, what area, what market area, what type of company, what are you looking for as an angel? You know, as an angel, the biggest thing, I'm looking for two things. Equal, the opportunity. And going back when I was in Colorado for 15 years, the, the private equity companies there always talked about this classic number. They were looking for billion dollar ideas. I don't know if we're looking for that here. I don't know if the guys around, the, around here in the, in the audience are looking for billion dollar ideas, but they're obviously looking for big ideas. So certainly the idea has to be, and that idea may be justified by patents, by being first to market, by being innovative, by really filling a niche, you know, the industry. The other thing, equal to me, Again, I come from the operations side, is the management team. Without any doubt, to me, it's all about the management. A great management team can execute on probably a poor business opportunity. A poor business team, they may not even do well with a great idea. So uh, what I'm looking for is obviously ideas, have a lot of meetings looking at ideas, go to Plains Angels and other, other things locally to, to network. Um, but in the end, I'm probably investing as much in the idea as in the management team. So anybody who knows me knows I'm a hopeless optimist and I like everything I see. <laughs> um, but we are at River Glen, a true seed VC firm. Uh, that's what we're aiming to be, is invest in ideas at out of gates. And we are getting, uh, despite my personality and, and inclination to, look, to like everything I see, we're focusing on three segments that we think leverage Iowa, what's good and best about Iowa. So first, ag technology. Um, so broadly, ag technology could mean a number of things. Uh, but we're looking uh, for companies that, that are, are hoping to address really big markets. Maybe they don't become a billion dollar business, but, but have the ability to get there in, say, 10 or 15 years uh, if they really work at it. Second sleeve that we're after is medical technology, trying to leverage what's going on both at Iowa State and at, at Iowa. Um, I can give you a quick story about a, a business we just looked at. Um, that's coming out of the University of Iowa, leveraging technology that was invented there. Super exciting uh, cellulose-based uh, membrane technology to create a uh, uh, artificial vein. So instead of doing bypass surgery with a procedure where you first harvest the vein from the patient's own legs, uh, clean it up, and then put it on the heart, bypassing arteries that are clogged, uh, they're aiming to use this this uh, cellulose membrane technology. That's a huge market. Um, there are two and a half million by bypass procedures that are done 
per year, and if they can create a medical device out of technology that's been invented in the labs at the University of Iowa, uh, licensed by the University of Iowa Research Foundation uh, to a team that has been there, done that, to Sheldon's point, it's got to be a team that's done it. Uh, the, interestingly, the guy who licensed the technology is none other than Manny Villafana. So Manny is, was a co-founder of three important businesses. The first is a company called um, Cardiac Pacemakers Incorporated, CPI. That became guidance and went over to Boston Scientific at $27 billion. Uh, the second thing that Manny did is a company called St. Jude Medical, still publicly traded. It's a $20 billion enterprise value business. Um, third thing that he did, uh, there's a company called ATS that, that does um, artificial valves. And that company went over to Medtronic for $400 million. This guy sees something in the technology out of the University of Iowa because he entered it into a licensing arrangement with the University Research Foundation. is aiming to try to take that technology to something well past a billion dollars over time. So, what I, so I'm not losing my optimism, we're just trying to get a little more focus. Third option is financial tech, you guys got in the Global Insurance Accelerator. We're interested in looking at things that, that address problems that are so big that they can add up to you know, tens, twenties, and ultimately hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. And our goal is to do it in a disciplined way where we partner with the, the entrepreneurs to get it done. Well, let's open it up for questions, and if you will, allow me to repeat your question once you say it. Let's make sure everybody hears it. Yes, sir. Do you see the crowdfunding uh, push expansion helping, hindering startups? Do you see any dangers to that as far as moving forward? There's a lot of buzz out in the startup community about crowdfunding. How do you see that impacting? Is that doing anything to that? Yeah, so let me restate the question. The question is about crowdfunding, and is it, I guess to summarize, is it a good thing, a bad thing, both, and what's it doing here in Iowa? Um, Eric, why don't you start? What do you think? I, I don't think the infrastructure is really built quite yet to make crowd, whether it's in Iowa or whether it's, you know, anywhere else, I think, I think there's a long way to go, and, and I really mean that by the infrastructure, so doing that efficiently. I mean, you got Matt here, and I know Matt, and I've worked with Matt, and there's a lot that goes into you know, trying to put a deal together and just putting a term sheet or something similar out, and, you know, getting a hundred or a thousand dollars from, you know, a hundred thousand different people is to me a recipe for absolute and utter disaster. Um, our deal, we like small-ish deals, and I mean maybe 20 on the outside, um, ideally in, in a lot of cases, two, three, one, five, um, because it's, you know, you can, you, can, you can actually funnel input and perspective and hopefully find alignment and agreement. Um, I, th I think crowdsourcing though has a huge, it's like Bitcoin to me. There's a lot of potential there. Um, but I think there's a, lot, there's a long way to go. You gotta build some infrastructure around that. Um, so JB, specifically, um, let's say one of the people in the audience, crowdfunds a deal, they raise $50,000 from 1,000 people, and then they need more capital. So what is it you have to tell them? Uh, I don't like your cap table. <laughs> <laughs> Start over. No, Start I don't. Over. Yeah, no, it is. It's not exactly. But explain why. I mean, well, so I mean, it's just we it, joke about the why. First point, I mean, to Eric's point as well, is it can bring in unsophisticated investors. So the investors are really not going to forge your business. It's just cash. And with that comes unreasonable expectations of the investors. You got, you know, Aunt Dorothy that wants her money back after she wrote it last, you know, a quarter later. Uh, secondly, is any any institutional investor, anybody even coming in, you know, some of the, like the Sheldons of the world that are going to come in and maybe an additional round, they're going to want things cleaned up, they're going to want to make sure that there's not a lot of disruption at the cap table. And, and to that point, I mean, we, we really do talk about keeping as clean a cap table as, as possible. So, you know, a lot of people will go and they're just going to go raise $500,000 and they're going to do it at $5,000 minimum. See, I don't, we don't want to touch it. I mean, you know, at least set the minimum to fifty thousand dollars. Find somebody that actually, you know, maybe can bring a little bit more than cash to the table. Um, the other thing about crowdfunding is, is 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 exactly that. I don't think the platforms are established. I think it I, it could become the wild wild west a little bit. I think there's going to be further regulations on it. 
um, I, which is, is changing, and I know Iowa is even going through a process right now after the SEC came out. So um, I think it's going to continue to evolve, and I think, it's, I think just like anything else, it's, it's going to become a very regulated marketplace as well. And I think, I guess what I would add to that, and then we'll go to the next question. Uh, for those of you who are just, uh, into history, the history of selling stock door to door after World War II, um, there was an awful lot of fraud. There were people going door to door selling stock. Now some of it was AT&T mm -hmm. and General Motors, and some of the stuff that didn't exist. And so a lot of the regulations we have today is because of some really, really bad things that happened in the, mostly the early 50s, I think, was the worst of it. Uh, it had to be cleaned up. So anytime you have people out there offering you know, huge returns on an investment, and very little money in. I mean, we all are smart enough to realize most days that's not a really great deal. Uh, it looks a little too much like the lottery. So the, the regulations, I'm not a big fan of regulation, but at the same time, having seen some of the other side of it, they're needed. So, next question. Yes, Kurt. Um, you know, a couple of you alluded to the unicorn market and the $362 billion that are out there. Um, 70% in the last year. Yeah. So it might not be Lehman, but some VCs are going to have a big shakedown. Right. How do you think that will affect, especially the big ones and the coasts, and what are they going to start doing next if they survive after they lift their wounds? Yeah, so after the big VC firms uh, reprice and revalue their, their potential unicorns that are no longer unicorns, what does that mean going forward for those firms and others? What, what kind of shock is going to come out of that? Can Shelby, do oh, you're here. go for it. Yeah, please do. All right. Uh, this is just my opinion. Um, if you look at where those kinds of valuations are, are are really taking place, the investors behind those investments are managing billions of dollars in VC <coughs> uh, on the coast, and the, the primary investors in those large funds are institutional investors. Uh, think you know. Entities like Hypers, uh, Iowa Public Employer Retirement System. Uh, so they're really well diversified. These folks are, uh, they've got tons of money. And uh, if they're exercising good judgment and, and good discipline in terms of how they're investing, not necessarily on the valuation front, but on the diversification front, they'll be able to mark down and, and you know, just like everything else, uh, we'll go through a cycle. And, and they, mostly when you have a VC firm allocating capital to your company. Uh, they're smart enough, uh, you know, I guess through experience to hold money back, call it uh, you know, reserving capital for subsequent follow-ons, uh, needing to feed that, that investment over time. So I think that money comes in, just comes in at a different valuation. I don't think it goes away. Um, and, I, and I also think you have to remember who the investors are in these funds. Uh, they're in those investments because it fits in the broader framework of their asset allocation construction. And uh, they're going to feed that part of the capital, capital structure of their asset allocation design no matter what. That's my opinion. I got one more thing. There's one more really important piece to that. And you, a lot of the sophisticated investors Matt's talking about, in a, in a, in a, I would say maybe in the majority of those deals, maybe not in Uber, but kind of the rest of them, had, had some pretty significant capital structure, um, let's say additions. And so you can put money into a two or $10 billion valuation, and it really isn't a two or $10 billion valuation if you have something called a liquidity preference. That's a little more of a debt like I get paid first. Um, you can, and then you have things you know you call perhaps anti dilution clauses, etc. You know if you're going to do a down round, and you know they have to kind of equalize uh, the amount of, of of your share, so it's really not a dilution for you. So there's there's a lot of these, and I'd say in, a, in probably the majority of those deals, you had some structural considerations that were in place in those deals where the really smart institutional money, if you will, probably has a lot of those features in their investing documents. So ultimately, and you can only go too far because ultimately if you look at all those deals into the letter of the law and the letter of that agreement, you can literally dilute the founders and the employees down to next to nothing. And that, at some level, you you know, legally, you're gonna have a right to down, you know, uh, you know, to get essentially dilute them significantly, but there's also a place where you've gotta keep your best people incentivized. So that really does leads to a negotiation down in value, but you're probably as a smart investor not going to exercise all your rights. Um, but it really does open up the stage for a fairly uh, good negotiation. I, I would just add that uh, 
if uh, investments at that kind of late stage at super high multiples goes away, then it'll return um, these uh, exciting growth companies back to the public markets, IPOs, sooner because they didn't have a reason to go if someone was willing to fund them at $10 billion, right? So they really didn't have a reason to have to go through that brain damage. <laughs> The back. No? So related to that, Sheldon, do you think that the issue has been that it's been difficult to do a public offering or that the capital was available from the other sources? So for, 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 yeah, I heard that question. You want to repeat it for me so that you hear? Okay. Um, he, the question is, do I think it would have been too difficult for them to have done a public offering on their own or they just were taking advantage of the, the pricing by the the hugest uh, private equity funds. They were, to me, private equity guys would probably should comment more than me, to me they were taking advantage of super high valuations, again, not needing to go to the public marketplace <coughs> at that point. That would be my opinion. I, I would echo that. I mean, even, even uh, you know, Fred Wilson, a few others, Mark Suster, have talked about the VCs and then their LPs getting a little drunk on what's going on with regard to it. They, they actually even viewed it as initially protected pricing into an, a future IPO. So I do I do believe that's exactly right. The valuations have been as, uh, at a very favorable uh, level for the, for, the, for the companies to, you know, take them away from even considering an IPO. Question? Yeah, so um, I got two questions. Oh, you only get one. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, I'll fit in one. <laughs> so what am I hearing? Are investors running scared? Or the fact that investors are looking at ag tech insurance and also biotech, is that because of location? So let me restate it and I'll answer it, give you my thought and we'll turn it over. So the question was, so based on this, are, they, are investors running scared? Are they just looking at certain segments like ag tech, financial services, et cetera? Is and, it a physical product? And is that because they're physically there or, and or a physical product, is that what you're saying? I, I, I will tell you that angels, by, by definition, angels and early stage investors really want to be close by. Um, if something's going wrong, you really don't want to be a thousand months away. I want to be close enough as an angel to be able to go over and help you and to talk to you and keep communications going. Um, so so there, there's always, I think, with the smaller investor desire to be reasonably nearby. For example, Plains Angels states they only invest in contiguous states around Iowa. So we're focused on Iowa, but we invest in contiguous states. And it's the idea of what can you, where can you get to in a day driving. So, but I think that the idea of any one segment um, with, again, going to the angel level, and Sheldon can speak a little further, this is we tend to invest in what we know. I'm not a medical technology person, so I tend not to invest in medical technology. I do know mobile computing and wireless, so I do tend to be over there. Um, and I think that, Sheldon, maybe you can pick up on what it, you know, it's... Nothing to add to that. I mean, yeah, I think people tend to invest in something they know. I mean, because in the end, that's their money. I mean, you know, the, you, know you, uh, you raise money from friends and family, those are people you may see on Sunday or Tuesday night or, you know, the next Friday night or whatever. So you, you get money from a fund, you better be prepared that it's also that. But then you know that they raise money from other people. So sometimes you may think, oh, I've got money from a fund. Well, there's really people behind that fund that made those investments. But at that angel round, you're going to probably, you know, maybe have mentor meetings or quarterly meetings or see them at church or basketball games, whatever. So you better be prepared to... Uh, to uh, you know, be straight up on that type of uh, relationship. I, I would add a little bit too. I, I think um, I don't think they're running. I think good deals get funded. I, I do, and, and I think that it's, you know, again, it's about that. It's about the management team, the entrepreneur, the the plan. Um, and so we've seen it. We're living it right now. There's good deals getting funded. Yeah, to me that was part of what brought this on. Is you look at these national presses a little down right now, a lot down in some areas. Um, look at what's happening to oil companies right now, right? I mean, bank stocks just the tank. We're seeing a lot of deals get done. You know, deals from early, early, early stage, 100K kinds of deals to half million deals, million deals, and, and one that was in seven. And I think that's a really strong message about the state of Iowa. I, Eric talked about less volatility here than the places. Our highs aren't as high, but our lows aren't as low. And we tend to have pretty pragmatic investors here. There aren't a lot of people running around here that I've seen are going, yeah, I'm going to put money into Uber. Most people running one, I don't get it. <laughs> I just don't understand how they can make that much money. I just can't do the economics. 
so the, the other comment too is, is is really deal flow too, and I don't know maybe you're going to get into that a little bit, but you know our unemployment rate where it's at and everything, there's not a lot of uh, dislocated entrepreneurs out there right now, and so I think candidly deal flow has been a challenge for the last 12 to 18 months. It has deal flow is way down. So the number of people who are seriously working on a startup, either part time or full time, is way down from where it was in 29 and 2010. Well, in 29 and 2010, there was a lot of people trying to figure out what to do to make it a living who had been displaced or were like, I got into a situation where it's like, okay, I'm not going to do the corporate thing again. I did my 22 years and made a decision to change. So some people had the motivation. Right now, for a lot of people, they've got offers, backing up offers. Uh, they can leave any day and go somewhere else. And anybody that's done a startup, it is not easy. And you work seven day weeks and it's hard and it's highly stressful and it's damaging to family. So it's not one of those, oh, this is fun. <laughs> okay. There are fun aspects, but I can tell you a lot of people will tell you how much fun it really is. So. <laughs> question. In the back. I have a question about beginning to uh, starting to invest as an individual. Um, what are some tips that you might go into that experience, uh, whether it's not working with family or the type of money that you might need to, to really make an impact? Uh, just kind of beginning to be an investor. So begin, you're looking for tips on beginning to be an investor. Are you talking pre-accredited investor or so those of us who are those who are not high net worth individuals? Is that what you're asking? Or are you talking about? I think, I think both. I mean, both. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, guys, what are your invest, What's your advice to a first-time angel or even somebody that says I'm not even anywhere close to accredited? What should I do? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> of course, you should do it. I love it. It's absolutely uh, the reason that you're uh, uh, an angel investor of any kind is because you want to bring some part of your portfolio alive. You know, have something that with soul in your investment portfolio. That would be my opinion. Um, but uh, there are elements of what I just said. Don't do it. Uh, that are really true. Uh, don't do it unless you can afford to lose money. Don't do it. And the way that we think about that, uh, we, we coach people around this, is either you fit what you do, you're going to out and invest into some part of your portfolio that merits that risk reward. So the micro cap part of your investment portfolio that supports your core goals, or you realize that you've got a bucket of capital that you could really view as aspirational. And what I mean by that is you could, it could go away and it wouldn't hurt you. Um, so if you can answer yes to either of those two questions, then I think uh, the, the next thing you need to do is if you do one, be prepared to do ten, uh, which means you need a mechanism for uh, getting in front of an adequate number of deals to make one deal happen. We typically look at a hundred. So if you're not, if you're not going to make it a full-time job, then uh, or it needs to be a significant hobby uh, so that you're seeing enough deal flow to get it uh, through the process of discovery and uh, with the intention of over, say, a four to five year period of time getting a portfolio of 10 positions. Um, so most of the time, as you heard from these guys, uh, folks who are in the business of fundraising want fewer investors so they'll make the minimum investments be high enough that it becomes inaccessible for most people. Uh, if you're going to put together a portfolio of 10 and each investment needs to be 50 because that happens to be the raise minimum, uh, then you've got to be willing to put 500 at risk. And then you start trying to fit that into the portfolio construction pathway or the aspirational bucket pathway and neither fits. So yeah. Uh, I, I would add to that one, one word in that statement of don't do it, don't do it alone. Um, particularly if you're starting out, I mean, buy Sheldon lunch. Um, you know, get 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 with a group of people that understand diligence, um, and and really, you know, try to understand the process, the due diligence. If you can come in with a group of people investing, um, and you know, there's a lot of mentors out there that can help you from an investor perspective as well to tell you the things to look for, the pitfalls. But also, then, if you create that ecosystem, there's a sounding board mechanism as well. <laughs> I think one thing I would add to it, if you're seriously about thinking about it and you're not at an accredited level yet, it's find some entrepreneurs that are having some success and offer to help them for no value. Just offer to help. Try to get involved. Try to figure out where you can add value. Because as an angel, if you're not adding value, it's probably not a very good idea to be an angel in that deal. 
Uh, and plus, please understand, as an angel, you'll get into a deal that will suck you down. Uh, there's, I have one deal that I'm uh, over a thousand hours in, personally, outside of my work. Just, just I've been in it for a couple of years now, and it takes a lot of time, a lot of weekends. And that's not part of I mean, I'm not getting paid for that. There's no money in that. And that is part of it. You work hard at you know, supporting that small company. So, you got a follow on? That's a whole, a whole different question. All right. How can you uh, be persuasive uh, while still not being full time? You, how can you be persuasive by not being full time? But uh, still not being full time? While, while still not being full time. Still not being full time. Full -time. Can I qualify that question? You're talking about as a startup? Yeah. Right, as an entrepreneur who may as have an entrepreneur. a job or is doing multiple things, uh, but still has the energy to bring something to life. Don't go out and raise money from anybody, any, anybody other than a friend, family, or a fool. I mean, and I say that a little bit in jest, but if we ever look at a deal, I, I, it's, just, it's not even worth addressing if somebody's not all in. It, it is every one of these guys up here that's ever worked with a successful startup or any business. It is way more than a full-time job, and I see it all the time, and that's the advice I give to, to every time I've had that question. Yeah, it's definitely my filter, too. If you're not full-time plus, and I mean 60, 80, 90 hours a week, and you're not ready to seven days a week with it, you shouldn't be doing it, even if it's your own money. Even if you've got the money to write all the checks you need to write, you still shouldn't be doing it part-time. Question? we got time for one or two more. Uh, can I, I, let me have one more yeah. uh, um, The other thing that I wanted to mention, Ben, it's Ben, right? It's been a while since I've seen Ben? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, the other thing that, that it was lost on me when I first started angel investing 15, 16 years ago was the discipline of understanding what I need out of the investment that I was making. Um, so, you know, the, the industry professionally would look for something in, on the order of 40% uh, average annual return from a venture uh, equity investment. So what does that mean? Well, that means that your money has to go up by 10 times in a seven year, roughly, period of time. So my answer to you, Ben, is if you can, uh, going back to this idea of should I invest, um, and or you ask somebody to invest in you, you know, with an idea that this 10 time, or any of those of you who raised your hand saying that you were ready to raise money, and you're asking the question, what valuation is appropriate? It all really comes down to artful math, mathematical <laughs> calculus. And at some point, you've got to you've got to be able to convince yourself, either as an investor or as an entrepreneur, that you can deliver that kind of 10 times growth pattern over a seven year period of time. And, and you know, to their point, you're not gonna get that done unless it's a full time effort. And that's, that's a big movement forward. Um, so. Yes, we're here. So there's some chatter, uh, pros and cons on uh, the formation of a new female investor group, angel investor group. And I'd love to hear your reactions on is that a good thing for the local ecosystem or is that a splintering that will not be healthy? So the question is, there's been a lot of chatter about a, I think it's Department of Economic Development's been promoting a new uh, female angel investor network in the state of Iowa. I believe your question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, we need more angels in Iowa would be the beginning of that. My response to it would be, we need more angels. Having heard what you just heard though, angel investing is not a, passive sport, so it has to be people who are actively wanting to do it. You have to want to do it. I think it's fantastic. I, I do think, and what Mike's done a good job with Plains Angels is, is that network of other angel groups as well. And so, I, I mean, I, I absolutely think it's fantastic. Um, but part of that process has got to be to collaborate, because I think it'll be challenging of just funding individual deals without other uh, investor groups and or angels involved. But, uh, fantastic. I should probably step in here and, and disclose that we're helping that organization. Uh, so Riverland Private Capital is providing the, the infrastructure to make that investment vehicle available for uh, that group if it gets off the ground. Um, so my view is, obviously, I'm excited about it. I think, I think it would be great. In fact, um, I, you know, I, I would candidly and transparently tell you that I'm better because of my wife. She's so much smarter than me. She made, she's uh, got a better calculus 
um, when to cut the cord uh, and move on to something different. Uh, she asked better questions than me up front, so I don't know if that's a, a female thing or what, but uh, more power to it. I hope it works. Can I just add one more thing to that discussion? Um, when I was in Seattle, the problem was having enough room in a deal to get all the investors in the one of the end. The investors were fighting to get into deals. Here we have entrepreneurs fighting to get enough investors into the deals. Our biggest challenge is Plains Angels is filling around. You want to raise a half million dollars, we're in for the first 180,000, so four, five, six, or so whatever. We really have to be in, not only for that, but we also have to be able to find the rest of it. And so, Tay Shavon, who's in the audience, has been working in Plains Angels behalf to build a syndicate, a very formal syndicate. What have we got, seven or eight groups now, Tay? Eight states. Eight states. And the idea is that when any one of our groups sees a deal, we are interested, in, we're going to invest it. We share it. So that rather than being 50, 60, 70 angels, it's 500 or 600 angels get to see the deal. And that's, so to the point of this, this group, one more group will be helpful, but any one group in the Midwest tends not, unless you're in Chicago, tends not to be able to fund the full round of the deal. Yeah. We got one over here, and then we're gonna wrap up. Well, actually, I made introductions about three years ago with the Women's Connection in Kansas City, the angel group. Right. And they regularly meet once a quarter with the other counterpart, and they trade deals back and forth. And they were so happy to reach out to the other states because they, even St. Louis and Kansas City, need that syndication. <coughs> Yeah. You just brought up the yeah, the comment is even some of the groups, the, the, the women, women angel groups in the larger cities are struggling on their own. They, they need the network. One more, then we're going to close it off. I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. My name is Heidi Wessels, and I am starting up the new angel investment. This is the lady who's going to start. <laughs> and it is getting started. Hi, Matt. Hi. I just started a couple weeks ago. So Congratulations. I'm very I'm good we're to glad see you're doing it. It is happening. So, and we are very much looking forward to working with other investors. We are at the end of our time. Uh, I apologize for everybody to shut this up. Can you gentlemen stay for a few minutes? Well, first of all, let's say thank you to the panel. Thank you all. For <laughs> Before you run off, please just leave your trash on the table. We don't have near enough trash cans for all these things. Please set it up on the table. If you want to get a chance to RSVP for the event on Friday, please see Kim right here at the door. Thank you. Everybody have a good day. Enjoy the warm weekend. Thank you.